from the event. Thank you for joining us from Seattle, so I appreciate him coming down here. It's a nice morning. Welcome. Yes. Uh, Thank So is anyone not familiar with Bitmoon? Just curious. Okay. Uh, so we're just a, uh, a provider of some spot services around encoding layer and analytics that you can incorporate into your workflows to, to, to use those aspects. Um, my role as solutions architect is just to support our customers uh, onboarding those products. Uh, but this particular presentation is uh, around uh, transitioning to multi-code streaming. So how many people here are serving video in H.265 or VP9 uh, in the industry? So a few folks. Um, okay. Agenda-wise, I'll just kind of be touching on sort of the codecs that are out there, uh, what the browser support looks like. Uh, for all those codecs, uh, what the value of moving to a multi codec strategy uh, is, why you might want to do it, why you might not want to do it, uh, and the challenges around moving to a workflow around that, and some of the problems you'll definitely run into, and some uh, trade offs you'll need to make in order to, to make this valuable for your business. So, uh, you know, from a codec landscape, uh, landscape perspective, uh, ABC has been, or H.264 has been the, the dominant codec in the market for quite some time. Um, recently, we've had H.265, BP, BP9 coming into play. Uh, browsers and uh, uh, market leaders there are starting to incorporate those uh, codec support for those inside of their, their browsers and, and also on the devices. Um, and now with AV1, uh, where they're trying to find a way to uh, get to a single codec in the marketplace to replace H.264, uh, AV1 is sort of trying to get there. Uh, there's some newer codecs coming out in the market as well, like BBC, uh, but realistically speaking, AV1 probably isn't really production ready for at least another couple of years. Um, but you know, we're starting to see different devices adding support for it, but there's just a lot of extra complexity around it. So I think realistically speaking, H.265 and BP9 are, are tangible codecs to, to work towards. Um, as you look to uh, break away from H.264, uh, but certainly AV1 is, is, is a good codec, uh, you know, experimentally speaking, but practically speaking, I don't think it's quite ready yet for the market. So a bit moving, we had a developer survey that went out to customers and anyone that was interested in filling this out. And we asked the question, which media codecs are you currently using? Of course, ABC was a prominent um, right there. Uh, between 2017 and 2018, we saw people starting to incorporate HEBC. I think a big part of that is fair play or uh, Safari support for HEBC on, on uh, newer versions of the OS and devices. BP9, we didn't see a lot of change over the years. And then AV1, I think the folks that mark themselves here were just still experimental users. I, I doubt that this is any kind of production ready type of uh, uh, number there. We also asked where are they planning to go in the next 12 months. Um, HABC again is the more popular one. We did see a decline over the years, over the year rather, uh, for BP9 and HABC, and that's largely because folks are starting to see that AV1 is making some progress. Uh, folks are working on improving the time it takes to encode to AV1. Uh, some newer device models are starting to add support for it. Um, but this again still is an experimental type of product to me. I don't think this means that 29% of the folks are going to go live with anyone in that time frame. So using that marketshare.com as a source, you know, this is the, the uh, landscape of codecs across the common browser set. So Chrome is still the common leader here uh, with support for VP9. Uh, Safari with H.265 support, uh, but this is largely coupled to uh, iOS 11 and Mac OS I Sierra. Uh, Europe devices got to code H.265, so it's not just always a matter of updating the operating system. The, the video uh, needs to be decoded. Uh, from a hardware perspective, um, from Firefox, they had support for VP9, but the market share is quite low. It's still a surprise to me. Um, Internet Explorer, 5% almost, but only H.264. And then Edge with everything but a tiny fraction of the share there. So in theory, you know, you've got a max potential support of 87% for H.265 and VP9, but realistically speaking, um, you know, this assumes that all Safari browsers, all Chrome browsers can support those products. And again, that's not the actual 
truth there. There are certain dependencies around that. So this is a theoretical map of potential market share as it exists today. Uh, we'll get closer to that theoretical max as uh, those legacy devices start to be decommissioned, as we just as Internet Explorer actually dies eventually um, and gets replaced by something else. So, as we saw in the previous chart, H.264 was still the predominant codec. So, why bother making a change? But everything, if H.264 is supported everywhere, what's the value in making that change to a new codec? So, with new codecs come. Um, you know, better features. So things like HDR, color um, matrices are, are supported in these newer codecs, not necessarily in, in legacy codecs. Um, a big part of these new codecs is trying to improve the compression that you can do uh, on, the, on each frame. So as a result of that, you can serve better quality video, but at a much lower variance. And that's probably the primary driver for any kind of transition. Um, and that's, and lar that's largely because if you can get lower bit rates on your content, you can obviously provide a better streaming experience. It means users on uh, less bandwidth can still get the best quality as much as possible. Uh, the, the streaming is more reliable since they don't have to adapt so much. Um, and as well, we find across different regions, while bandwidth is getting better, there's more access to, to larger pipes out there in the world. Uh, data plan overages are still a big problem, especially in sort of Latin America and, and APAC regions, um, where we find that users prefer to cap the playback experience at sort of mid-levels as opposed to letting the player adapt even though the bandwidth can support it, because then they have to compete with the overages that they might incur as a result of that. And so if you can offer a better quality video at a lower bit rate, you're targeting, you're able to meet those or provide a better user experience to those folks that have to be mindful of those other things other than just what bandwidth they have to stream the video. To your business, that all comes back to um, a reduced cost of streaming video. If you're serving less bits, that means you're paying less to stream it, and that's effectively the best value for you. Even if you uh, break even in some of the costs that come out of doing this, at least your users can get a better experience out of all this. It's not just about how much you can save, but if you can spend the same amount of money, but your users are getting better user experience, getting better quality, and can consistently stream your video, that attracts them to your platform over a competitor that uh, is having trouble doing that. So um, just a couple of quality comparisons that we've, uh, that I've found and we've been able to run myself. Um, I see most folks here are familiar with PSNR score metrics. Um, obviously it's sort of not the def it, it's the de facto standard to start with, but I think there is it's arguably um, a poor metric in some ways, um, but it's a good place to start. If you're not familiar with PSNR, it's, it's a way in which you can com uh, compare the source frame of the video with an output frame and to see how much difference and variation there is between those two frames. And that score is then measured, uh, measured in, in, in decibels. Uh, generally speaking, good quality video falls within 35 and 45 decibels. Anything below that, you can assume that there's a lot of artifacts in the video. Anything above that is largely not perceptible to the human eye, in theory. Um, so generally, when you're trying to find scores around PSNR, you want to anything between 35 and 45 is, is a good metric to target. And so we can see here the, with the one with the point circled that in order to achieve about a 44 decibel PSNR score, with ABC, which is a yellow square on the right, you need close to seven megabits of data to get there. Whereas with HEVC, you're going to use, uh, in this case, six megabits, and with AB1, considerably less, uh, around 4.5. And so, really, just encoding to a different uh, codec, you are able to save your streaming costs by that much, and your users are able to get to those same quality scores using less bits to get there. This is another example where it's a bit more dramatic here. This was a 26-minute asset that uh, was, was fairly low complexity, not a lot of heavy action scenes. So this is why we can see a significant difference here, where in order to get to approximately, sorry, I can't say that number, 42 or so, uh, we're looking at 6.8 megabits to get there, whereas AV1 and H265 um, VP9 wasn't included in this one, but what we find is VP9 and H.265 are fairly similar in terms of uh, the savings you can get. Um, but you can see that 81 uh, with a similar bitrate to HGDC, 
actually improve the scores uh, considerably. And we also did a test there where we dropped the 81 bit rate even further, and the scores there are still uh, better than the uh, ABC uh, scores there. So, you know, practically speaking, these codecs are doing a good job of getting better quality video with less bits, um, and that's a primary factor there. Um, but then, of course, you know, there's some other improvements these codecs make um, and, and goals that they're trying to achieve that uh, we're not going to spend too much effort on H.264 trying to achieve. Um, from that previous graph, just the file size comparison as a result of this. So you can see that H.265, AV1, and the AV1 with even a lower bit rate uh, requires less storage compared to uh, H.264. So this also saves you in storage costs. That's probably the most, probably not the most expensive aspect of your business, um, but it's still a factor that you need to maybe want to account for as you're looking to roll out a multi-coding strategy. So we run through a sample user scenario uh, or a streaming scenario uh, to translate some of those benefits to cost savings. So we assume that your users on average are doing 15 minutes, 15 minutes of video, and you have 1 million views at 1080p quality, um, and your CD cost per gigabyte is 2 cents. Um, and you could go one, uh, sorry, you go 1 million views, and we're assuming that based on the previous chart where I had 87% is a theoretical max of uh, multi codec support. And 13% being everything else that doesn't support multi codecs, just supports H.264. So in theory, you've got around 130,000 views where you're going to be hitting only users that can support H.264, and then everyone else potentially could be streaming content in H.265 or AP9. So we take those minutes and translate them to seconds, and then we multiply the seconds by that top end bit rate from the previous PSNR chart that I had, where we were using 6.8 megabits for the H.264 rendition. We're looking at 0.77 gigabytes of bandwidth consumed by a single view uh, for a user uh, that was streaming 6.8 megabit H.264. And then comparably to the 2.8 megabit H.265 or BP9 equivalent of that, they're consuming 0.32 gigabytes of bandwidth consumed. And this again is really targeting the same quality level, but consumption difference in terms of bitrate. So then if we multiply that uh, amount of bandwidth to the, the cost of streaming, and we're looking at those numbers for per view per user for your content. And then if we take those per view uh, numbers and multiply them by the total view, share uh, across the different um, percentages between users that can watch H.264 versus the other codecs. Um, you're looking at a total multi-coder cost of about 7500 to stream this content. Comparably to just if you go straight H.264, you're spending 15000 to do that. Right? So you're paying twice as much in order to uh, stream just H.264 if, um, if your user base is you know, at 80% of the market share able to watch the other codex, you could save yourself off that. The reality, again, is not everyone, not 80% of those users are going to be able to watch H.265 or VP9, so your costs are actually probably a lot less than, cost difference is probably a lot less than this, uh, but this is hypothetical. So really what you're trying to figure out is, okay, through these cost savings, through the numbers that I know about my user business, um, am I saving enough to warrant all the extra effort to incorporate multi-codec into uh, my workflow. Yeah. You have to account for things like how much it costs to store that extra file, all those extra files. You have to account for you know, whether your actually market is actually capable of streaming those things. Um, and again, even if you do break even here, maybe you're not saving yourself or your business much money, the end result is you're still able to provide a better user experience because your users will be able to view the same content but at a much higher quality. So if anything, think about your users. So what are some of the encoding challenges? Um, well, new codecs have been slower to encode in the past. Uh, I think that's starting to improve H.265. I mean, from the bit movement side of things, we're starting to see H.264 and H.265 encode around the same time frame. Uh, VP9 is more or less the same, maybe a little bit slower than H.265 from what we've seen. 
81 is still significantly slower. Um, again, probably not practical for day to day um, uh, encoding workflows. Um, but even still, to achieve some of that, uh, you know, to achieve a one to one encoding time between H.264 and H.265, you may need to allocate more compute in order to get there, which means you're maybe increasing the cost it takes uh, that you have to spend in order to produce some of these outputs, including the workflow. You also add in um, some workflow complexity. Now you're not just dealing with maybe a HLS with transport streams of H.264, which in theory works everywhere today. Um, now you have to account for these different files and these different MOXIE formats and uh, you know, your system has to be updated to account for different types of manifest packages uh, that can then be served to different devices appropriately. Um, so that's a little, a little of orchestration that you need to start thinking about within your internal systems that uh, you know, all plays a part in whether this is a good fit for you. And then do all my assets need a multi-code exclusion? If I'm focused on breaking news where I just want my content to go out there, I don't really care about my quality, but I want it out there as soon as possible, do I need to worry about doing multi-code export for this? Multi breaking news has become pretty irrelevant pretty quickly. Um, so is it worth doing that versus focusing my efforts on doing multi-code on my full-length uh, 4K sourced assets? Right? Maybe those, that's the only content you really want to focus on to, to offer multi-codec and everything else is just stays with H.264. Right? Is it worth adding all this extra complexity for, for certain types of content? And obviously if your input content isn't high quality enough, it's all low resolution and that's another factor in why you may or may not want to get multi-codec. So some of the playback challenges. How does my player know about making the right uh, codec choice? Uh, generally speaking, you may need to have some logic inside of your player that says, hey, if this is Chrome, I know it supports VP9, so if I have a VP9 stream, uh, use that, otherwise don't use that, use H.264, etc. Um, user agent tables to, to make this selection isn't really the best approach there because maintaining uh, that table uh, can get stale really quickly. Um, nowadays, browsers have APIs where you can check what kind of codecs they support. So it's better to go, do you support H.265, and if so, serve H.265, and not care about what particular codec or what particular browser you're actually uh, streaming on. Then other implementation factors around the player are just how aware it is of multi-codec streams. In most cases, a player is going to take in one URL, and then that's going to uh, be what the player initializes. So now your player has to maybe take in multiple URLs and have to make that decision and decision against these multiple URLs. Or maybe you have to be the one that makes that decision and feeds that particular URL into the device in order for it to play back appropriately. So again, you're talking about additional implementation overhead inside of your player framework in order to support multi-coder. And it's a lot easier just to feed one stream into a, into a player and, and expect it to work as it would with H.264, generally speaking, today. So there's a couple of ways in which you could prepare your multi-coded packages. You could have, you know, in this case, maybe you've got a single HLS, and within that you've got playlist variants that point to the different codecs. That's not necessarily a commonly supported strategy across different devices. Not all devices are going to be able to interrogate the manifest and understand what codecs are within your manifest, what codecs are supported by my device, and pick the right playlist appropriately. You might just pick the first variant in the playlist, which could be VP9, which isn't supported in your device. So you need a player that's intelligent enough to be able to parse that single HLS and make sure that it's only feeding the appropriate playlists to the device uh, that are part of a codec that it supports. Or again, you go through the, se the uh, separate strategy of creating a different manifest for each codec. You've got a HLS manifest for H.264, you've got a HLS manifest for H.265, and again, now I have to have an updated system that's aware of managing all these different uh, manifest URLs in order to feed to the appropriate, appropriate device set. But the key thing with going multi-codec is really to understand your audience. I mean, it's not going to do any good rolling out VP9 and H.265 support if most of your, view, your uh, viewers are on iOS um, 9, for example, where none of these codecs are um, 
Also, you also want to understand where they're watching your content. Are they on the couch? Are they are they moving around? Are they mobile on, on cellular networks? Uh, are, they, are they at home on a LAN cable on a desktop computer? Uh, these factors tie into whether it's really worth your time um, and your money and your debt team's time to go out and implement a multi coding strategy. Um, in any case, it might still be valuable. Let's say you know that your user base is all on iOS 11 devices. It just happens to be where your target market is. Uh, it's still valuable, and then in that case, going all to H.265. Maybe you just drop H.264 entirely, because now most of or all your users are on H.265. Now you can get to them. Um, you can save yourself on streaming costs, because you're getting to them better quality video at lower bit rates. Uh, so in that case, it's valuable. It doesn't have to be multi-coded, but it's a different codec to what you would normally potentially serve, because you can through your market, uh, your, your user base. And then again, back to the break and use concept, I mean, understand your content. Is it really worth um, the time and workflow orchestration it takes to produce a multi-codec strategy for the kind of content you have? Um, versus, you know, if you just got short user-generated clips, there's, there's no value really in mul doing multi-codec there, since commonly, uh, at least in the past, the inputs for those assets have to be very high quality in order to warrant uh, trying to maximize a bit rate usage there. So in summary, until another codec becomes a new H.264, you really need to assess whether multi-codec strategies are worth, uh, worth the time it takes to get there for your business and your users, right? Uh, this isn't a yes or no answer. You have to really analyze where your users are, what kind of content you have, how long it's going to take to produce this, how long it's going to cost me to produce these assets, um, and does that allow me to save money or at least break even in order to to achieve this particular goal. And if it doesn't, then there's no reason not to stay on H.264 uh, because I don't see another codec taking over uh, the presence H.264 has today or any time in the next few years. I think we are going to be in a fragmented codec space for quite a while. Um, so it's, 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 it's important to start thinking about it, but I don't think uh, we're going to see something as dominant as H.264 in the near term. And that's, at the end of the day, though, as I've said before, is better quality at lower bit rates is always a good thing. If anything for your user base, and if anything for your streaming costs, if you can achieve that without spending more money, then it's still worth the time to try and get there, from my perspective. And that's it. Thanks for your time, folks. I just wanted to see if anyone had any questions or comments on their experience rolling out multi codex support. So there has been a lot of controversy over the last year about uh, HEC patent pools and the, uh, the licensing cost. But when I'm looking at your graph and I see HEC uh, deployments growing, I'm thinking actually people, they don't care about that. They just want to get the best performance, right? That, that's the experience that I've seen is that a lot of these um, royalty concerns don't really play a factor in someone's goals to achieve or utilize those codecs as much as they probably should. You know, until you get sued by someone that costs you a ton of money, it's probably not a big factor for you from what I've seen with, with customers that I've worked with or, or companies that I've worked at that are rolling out video solutions today. Um, so. That's a scale issue, right? So it's, you're not going to get hit with patent lawsuits unless you're CBS rolling out H265 <laughs> or some huge company, right? So right. is there some threshold? Do you know if those numbers from Bitcoin's uh, surveys correlate to smaller vendors, smaller groups doing that kind of as they do with Dash with the patent rules? Or, you know, like uh, I'm not sure. Uh, that's an interesting question, though, and I'll see what uh, the team that put that data, detail together um, had around that. I, the, to kind of continue on that same thought, BP9 is Google, right, or uh, BP10. So they're not, there's, there's obvious comments that Apple will never take something like that off. Right. They'll never secure it, so they'll never, they'll never run out. And AB1 is just cost compute issues, right? It's, it's just the cost to, 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 and the time to, to compute the encoding. Is there anything else on AB1 that's going to limit people to the path pools forming? Is, there, is it proprietary in the large browser vendors? No, right? It's completely open. And I think I seem to recall something control related yeah. around everyone recently. I don't really know what the circumstances were, were around that, but 
so there may be a factor there, but I think as it stands today, it's it's intended to solve some of those challenges that have existed with trying to get H.265 and GP9 at the door. Um, so we'll see if that actually comes later. It seems like the next logical. Yeah, I think the pattern pool is for VP9 and AV1, both codecs at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what's your estimation about AV1 maturity cycle? Because we've seen that on the decoder side, there has been a lot of progress in the, in the past year, but it seems like on the encoding side of things, it's slower. Yeah, I mean, I think I've seen a lot of progress around the David encoder um, or codec uh, implementation where they've made some good leaps in improving the time it takes to encode to that codec, but it's still it's still considerably slower. I mean, from them, the tests that we've we run is like 40% slower than VGVC. Um, and again, I, I don't think there's as much emphasis to really try and improve that until devices start to support AV1. I think we're seeing a lot of people now just starting to incorporate H.265 and VP9 into their workflows that they're not they like where AV1 is going and what it can do, um, but practically speaking, they're not going to invest too much time getting there when they haven't even incorporated some of these other codecs that have been out there for five years or so. Um, but you know, I think every day we're going to see improvements to to AV1 in terms of uh, processing throughput. Uh, but uh, I still think we're at least a year away before we see someone actually go to market with AV1 that isn't Google or some large provider that has a lot more control over the device and manufacturing process and then the browsers and whatnot that So, yeah. is your vision, uh, let's say, uh, let's say five years vision, uh, is it that AV1 is going to replace H.264 and VP9, and so we will have a HEVC versus AV1 fight, or do you see a much more complex situation for the for the next five years? I think it's still going to remain complex. Um, I think there's still going to be a lot of devices out there that aren't going to move towards supporting AV1 or a single codec that, that could replace H.264. So I think we're still going to be in a heavily fragmented world. We still have you know, companies saying, I don't want to use this codec over that codec because it's developed by my competitor. You know, again, AV1 is intended to address that, but I think at the end of the day, they're going to find ways to remain competitive. Every one of these large companies now has their own video store, so they're trying to make themselves unique. At the end, I don't think that they're all going to come together and all move towards a single codec, even in the next five years, where we can start uh, we can stop thinking about multi-codec strategies and just focus on this one. I, I, I personally don't think that will be there in five years. Let's just say one codec, one DRM, one browser. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dream. Yeah. And, and you don't even talk about uh, China where they have their own codecs. Uh, question. Uh, I'm sort of googling. I found. Uh, I was going to ask if, if AV1 is scalable, and I found uh, SVT AV1. I don't know if you looked at that. Just Intel and Netflix. Uh, um, I heard that they uh, Intel were working on something around that, um, and I forget which vendor was starting to incorporate that. Um, that I think it's a particular chip that has support for that. Oh, okay. Um, and so they're then incorporating that into their compute. Resources. I don't recall which vendor it was specifically, though. Okay. Um, it seemed like that would solve the multi-screen you know, <laughs> potential. I think that's a challenge too. Is now you've got all these different branches of AV1 being worked on by different companies, and now no, there's there's no sort of consolidation as a result. That now we're going to have different people incorporating different codecs, um, and I haven't seen any movement around trying to you know, consolidate into one and extend a single branch effectively of the AV1 codec so that it's usable by all without any concerns. Everyone's still going to try and be the innovator to get to the to prove that theirs is the best and as a result that's going to fragment I think the industry a little bit more um, as a result of that. Do you know if anyone's uh, trying to accelerate using GPU code instead of the uh, are these guys uh, uh, not in the in the encoding business. <laughs> <laughs> Just the packaging. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I mean, from the BitMovement side, we, um, you know, we do support if you want. Our approach to encoding is parallelizing sort of gov chunks. So we stay with CPU encoding, but we just scale horizontally and process it as quickly as possible. Whereas other strategies are a little different there. All right, thank you very much.